three, two, one. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Thank you. You can have a seat. Now, when it comes to anxious and situations that are that lead to anxiety and worry, uh, it's important maybe for us to start with the idea that it's reasonable to be anxious and to have and to have worry. Like the, the reason we have the, the anxieties and some of the things that we have, it's, a, it's reasonable. It's not unreasonable. It's not silly uh, to to have anxiety. Uh, and, and worry about some things. In fact, most of us would say uh, that it's understandable. If I were to sit down with you and you say, man, I'm worried about whether I'm gonna get this bill paid or I'm worried about my rent getting paid or I need a job or whatever it is that you might be sort of working through that's causing whatever unsettlement in your spirit, most of us would probably sit down when upon hearing that, like, yeah, man, I mean, I know that would be that would be tough to be in that situation. It's it's understandable, it's reasonable, and if we're not careful, then we will we will settle right there. We'll we'll, we'll believe that our anxieties and our stress and our worries, because they make sense that we have them, that it's good enough that we just settle settle there, you know, and we don't really move past. Uh, what it means uh, to deal with that. Because it's reasonable, because it's understandable that we would feel that way, we, uh, we, would, we would sit still and maybe not deal with it as well as we could. We would sit in anxiety instead of pursue the peace that the scriptures describe. But the scriptures here say, right, because we don't want anxiety, hopefully, we don't want anxiety, we want, we want the peace. And the scripture says, the promise that it says is, let's look at the second half. It says, and the peace of God, which what? Which transcends all understanding. The peace of God that's unreasonable. The peace of God that doesn't make sense, right? The peace of God that shows up in a counterintuitive kind of way. The scripture says that if you want, you, that you, that we, we've talked about this in the past, that you're going to have trouble, that you're going to have issues and things that cause anxiety and, and we can go even further saying that it's reasonable to be stressed about things that re that would be stressful but the scriptures the miracle of the scripture and, and, and what God is saying is that, that he's going to give you a peace that doesn't make any good sense and the key to the peace that you need that doesn't make good sense in the midst of your anxious and your stormy weather as my dad would say is thanksgiving, the spirit of thanksgiving, the counterintuitiveness of thanksgiving in the middle of pain and uncertainty and worrisome situations. It's not natural for us to go to thank God when we should be, when we feel like we need to be asking God to clear something from us. It's not natural for us to thank God when we break our leg. It's natural for us to pray to God to fix our leg, right? It's not natural for us to thank God when we need to pay the bill. It's natural for us to ask God to help us to come through, right? But the scripture says, don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, it says your prayers and petitions make sense, they're reasonable, but with thanksgiving is the counterintuitive peace. And because of that counterintuitive action, you get a counterintuitive result. And you get the counterintuitive nature of peace. The key ingredient is thankfulness in the midst of trouble. And that is, that is a tough thing for us to learn as God's people. And that's why we're doing this series. The series is trying to help us, like, how do we get our minds wrapped around being thankful in tough and anxious moments? How do I respond with a prayer to God to, to deal with my situation, but also have a spirit and a posture of thankfulness in the same, at the same time. That is what we're trying to deal with today. Mm. Okay, so we're going to jump into Psalms 139. Each week we're going to look at a different psalm. Today we're looking at Psalm 139. You begin to turn there. Psalms 139, we'll look at 1 through 18. We'll do it uh, piece uh, by piece. Uh, but before we get into the passage, I want, I want to, I want to, 
drop this on you before we before we get to the sections. First thing I want you to understand or think about today before we read this passage is that um, you know, when I was doing a study, there was one word that kind of really changed everything about the study I was doing. I was doing the study, and I was like, man, I was actually having some hard times trying to figure out how I was going to uh, work this out, right? And then one word showed up, and it changed everything for me, and that word is expert. I know y'all thought it was going to be some really profound word, like, what's the word? Expert. Think about this. God is an expert on you. What is, what is an expert? An expert is someone who knows the ins and outs of its subject matter. In fact, Kobe Bryant is a basketball expert, and don't look, come find me if you, know, if you disagree. I got number 24 under my shirt now, show Kobe Bryant's an expert, why? He's, how, what, he's an expert on his subject matter. He knows the ins and outs of basketball. He can tell you everything that you need to know about basketball. Pick an expert that you know. An expert knows everything about his subject matter. How does the expert know that? The expert knows the uh, the expert knows that because it spent tons of time with the subject matter that it's an expert of. If you're a counselor, you're, you've been to school for years to learn how to do that well. You're an expert. You know, Malcolm. Uh, Gladwell, he said, uh, he said, you know, to be a proficient, to be a, a pro, I guess, at what you do, he, he tried to clock it at 10,000 hours. Somebody heard of that, 10,000 hours? Anybody? Okay, maybe the three of us. The 10,000, the 10, what it means is that you should do something for 10,000 hours before you become really, really good at it, before you're a, a pro, you're an expert, before you reach a, a certain level of success. If you're an expert, you need to spend time and energy and effort in the subject matter that you are saying you're an expert on. And then the other thing that an expert knows, he knows the core, he or she knows the core purpose or idea of the subject matter. And you can put your own explanations around what an expert is, but what I want you to know is that God is an expert on you. You can say that God is an Antoine expert, or your name ain't Antoine, put your name in there. Like, God is a blank, your name, expert. He knows everything about you. He knows the ins and outs of you. He spent tons of time and research and, 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 and watching and learning and developing his ideas around who you are. And he knows the reason for which you exist. He knows your core purpose. God is an expert on you. And as an expert, these are the three things we're going to talk about when we read the scripture. We're going to talk about how God knows you. There's three categories. God knows you. God is near you. And yet God has destined you. God knows you. God God's near you. And God has destined you. All right. Let's jump in. So God knows you. Section number one. We'll look at verses one through six. Uh, we'll, we'll read this and then we'll kind of jump in and, and figure out what, what this all means for us. God knows us, he's an expert on us, and this is what the scripture says. It says, oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You, you know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You, are, you comprehend my path and my lying down, and you are acquainted with all of my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, oh Lord, you know it all together. You have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. It's high, I cannot attain it. Now, one of the greatest needs in the human heart is to be known. Would you agree with this? Like the, it's, the, it's a humongous need. No one wants to be alone, no one. It's a scary proposition for many to die, to die alone. Like, there's, there's, a, there's a thing inside of all of us that we want to be known, but not only be known, but to be understood. We want to be known and understood. understood. We, uh, we have that as a core desire for who we are. But it doesn't stop there, right? Because we could be known and understood and, and still not be quite satisfied. Here's the thing that I think we really need. We, we, we have this core desire to, to not only be known fully, but to be valued at the end of that knowing. Knowing. This is what I'm saying. God wants... We, not God, we want to be known, and then we want to be valued for what people find. We want someone to know us, and then they want us, you want, we want people to value us after they know us. And, and it's a scary thing, because most of us are afraid that if people really knew us, they, we would get a whole bunch of weird 
responses. Like, yeah, I mean, they, they, they know the stuff I show them, but if they just knew this, or if they just knew that, or if they just knew what I was really sort of thinking. This is the importance of, say, friendships in a marriage. In a friendship, the best friendships are the people who know you the best, right, and value you after they know you. They're the people who stuck around, who, who, who said that you were worth whatever trouble it was that your, no, them knowing you may have caused. Same thing with marriage. When you go and you want to find a husband or a wife, the whole, the whole set is that you get to know each other intimately and closely, and then you would choose to stick together after the knowing. And there's something about God that being chosen and being valued after being known and understood that satisfies the human heart. All of us would want that. Some of us are looking for community. Like you can, you can figure out where you are with that. And so we can be thankful that in this picture, at least at the very, at the very cursory look at this picture, we can see that even though it may be a little uh, freaky that God knows everything about us, we'll deal with it in a minute, that God knows everything about us, like there's nothing that we can hide, there's everything, he knows everything, we can be thankful that even on the other side of his knowing us, God still loves us. That even on the other side of knowing every thought that we have, knowing all of our sayings, whether we actually speak them or not, knowing what causes us to rise and to fall, that in the middle of knowing all that, the pure and the impure, the good and the bad, the positive and the negative, that at the end of that, God still chose to die for you and for me. And in that, we can know that we can be grateful and thankful to God because we are set, our value is set with him. God knows us, the scripture shows us in that first passage that God knows us intimately. To be known, you hear me say it all the time, means to be, is, is to know someone intimately, is to, uh, is to, uh, to dig into the, the, the deeper, the, the depths of an individual and to know those depths of a person. It says, God, that, that word there says, you, you know my, uh, brother, you, you have searched me and known me. You have searched me and you know who I am and and you still love me, is the point we want to make. It says, you know my sitting down and rising up, you understand my thoughts from afar. And of course, this is, a, this is a hymn and it's poetry. So what does he mean? You know, obviously, he's not just talking about like, God knows your calendar, he knows you're sitting down and rising up. He's like, I know where you're going all the time. That, yeah, but what, what's really happening in, in, this, in this section uh, is God understands the way that we think. Everything about this section is, the, the psalmist is saying, that he understands the mental side of who we are. All right, we're gonna dig in a little bit deeper. This is a little academic. But it's the mental side of who we are. He says, he says, I understand your rise, you're sitting down and you're rising up. You understand my thoughts from far off. What he's saying is, I understand what motivates you. I understand what causes you to get up, what causes you to rest. I understand what goes on in your mind. First Samuel says this. <clears throat> First Samuel says, for the Lord does not see as man sees on the outward, for man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. The Lord looks internally, inside. You can go back to the previous slide. So he says, I know he knows what you're, we're, how we're motivated, what causes us to get up and go. And, and, and here's the thing, like a lot of us, when we think about God knowing us, we kind of like this, the verses that say God knows my heart. Anybody, has anybody ever heard or said, I, I don't know why I get y'all to raise your hand. I'm just going to assume that everybody has heard and said, uh, God knows my heart. God knows my heart, right? But typically we say that when we're like, our intentions are good. We don't go that God knows my heart when our intentions are bad. We miss that. We know like, oh, snap, God knows my heart. You know, we don't, we, don't, we, don't, we don't say that, right? We typically think of God's nearness and God's goodness and all these things when we need it in a positive way. But the reality is that God is present and God loves us and God knows us in our good and our bad. And it's important for the psalmist trying to get us to understand that that matters for our thankfulness to God because he loved us beyond our faults and saw our needs. God knows what drives us. He knows what end games we're pursuing. He knows our truest intentions. <clears throat> Here's the deal. We have no choice. Listen to this. You have no choice to be on, but to be honest with God. Like you can't, like you can't lie to God. You can't hide from God. 
Like there's no way like I'm gonna try to I'm gonna try to trick I'm gonna try to just show this part of me to God and keep this up. Like God sees all of it is what this what the psalmist is saying. He said, I see it all. I see I see the good. I see the bad. There's no way that you can hide from me. He knows the thoughts that we're thinking before we're thinking. How many of us would sign up for the program that we could put into our brains that keeps us from <laughs> that keeps us from not saying what we're thinking? <laughs> that we would never say it differently because I'm not confused. <laughs> so that we would say what we're thinking all the time. Like you have no choice. You just like blah. You just go blah. Like whatever you're thinking is. Nobody signs up for that, right? We all hide behind the wonderfulness of our consciousness because we don't want to let people know what we're really thinking about them all the time, or what we think about this scenario all the time. But but the Lord, but the Scripture says that God sees our thoughts before, right? It's that way with Him. Like there's, it, He knows He knows me that way. He knows all of us. Um, that way. We know how to manipulate social constructs we can manipulate uh, God. Then the scripture says, such is too wonderful uh, for me, down at the bottom. Such is too wonderful. Now I want you to know wonderful there is not like the synonym for good there. It's not like such is awesome. He's not saying it's awesome. He's saying it's too full of wonder. It's too full of awe. He said it's, and then he said it is high. I cannot contain. He said I can't even fathom a God that would know everything about me and you and you and you and you and you, all of us at one time. Now, what is the purpose of all this, right? It's, on the cursory level, it's to say that you can't hide from God mentally. We can hide from each other mentally, but we can't hide from God mentally. Uh, that, on another uh, uh, a key element to this is that because we can't hide from God mentally, God still loves us even though we say and think and are motivated by things that are not him. And we can be thankful that he's not, that he's responded in that way. But we can also know that God, we can be humbled by the fact that God is magnanimous and humongous and we are small and insignificant. Uh, we should, uh, or rather we are small and we're small, maybe not insignificant. You're significant, I'm sorry. Okay. We should be humbled by God's complete understanding of who we are and how we think and how we act and speak. Listen, we should be humbled by that. What do you do with this information? What, what this information should help you understand, hopefully, who God is. Here's what it should do. It should make your Christianity real. I'm always talking about this. It should make it real. Like it's not a fabrication. It's not a, it's not a social construct. We serve a God that is real, that knows the real you, that knows the ugly you, the best sides of you, the, the potential that you that he created you with. And he loves and has done everything that he's done in spite of that information. And we can be thankful for that. Now, here's what the enemy wants, because all this is in response to anxious situations. What does this have to do with our anxious situations? When we get into anxious situations, the enemy wants to tell us that we, that God doesn't love us, that we disqualify. This is when the voices start to come about disqualification. He says, you know, God sees your hypocrite, your hypocrisy. Uh-huh. You go to Elevate or you go to Sunday night and you do all that worship stuff. But then when you're in the midnight hour, you're doing this. And God doesn't like that. And so he doesn't love you. That's what the enemy is telling you. He wants, he, 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 first, he doesn't want you to know that God loves you beyond your faults, right? That he has replied his grace. But, but if you must know that God knows everything about you, then he'll make you believe that you're disqualified in that knowing. But the core need that we all have is that we will be fully known and that we will be fully loved on the other side of that knowing. And God fulfills that desire. Romans 5 8 says that God shows his own love for us in this. Watch it. While we were sinners, that's everything we we're just talking about. While we were doing all the craziness, while we were thinking the crazy things we were thinking, while we were motivated in the wrong ways by selfish sins, in the midst of all of that, he knew it, he wasn't fooled by it. 
you didn't do anything that made God feel like, you know what? I don't see the ugly stuff. I only see the awesome stuff. And I'm only going to die for the awesome stuff in Antoine's life. God knew it from the whole beginning. He had the whole thing figured out. He saw the ugliest you and the best you. And he said that I'm going to die for you. He says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And we can be thankful in moments of anxiety that God loves us regardless of what it looks like. We can be thankful that God loves us regardless of what it looks like. The last piece of the verse in this particular section says, you have hedged me before, uh, behind and before, and, let, and it said, then later it says, he lays his hand on us. If you go back to the, the verse one through six, <clears throat> he hedges us in. So think about this, right? If you, if you really think about this stuff at the top, you think about how, how much of a mess you are, I think about how much of a mess I am. I say, man, what would God do with me, really? If, you, if God really sees all the ugly stuff, the, the impure thoughts and all the things that goes on in my head, surely, surely he wouldn't want. And what is Jesus' response? Uh, what is God's response? It says, you have hedged me behind and before, and you laid your hand on me. Hedge means you have captured me. You have, you have held me in. And this is the message here. God chooses to take us in. He doesn't choose to throw us out. He says, I got all the ugliness. I know everything. I know the worst you. And I'm not going to throw you out because of that. I'm actually going to draw you in. I'm going to draw you in. He puts his hands on us. And this, this word can mean, it, it can mean discipline as well as protection. It's used both ways in the passage, and it really doesn't matter because it's all love. Whether God is disciplining us, he's loving us, or whether he's protecting us, he's loving us. The point is that he's loving us, that he doesn't give up on us, that you've got crazy thoughts, I've got crazy thoughts, and God loves us, he died for us, he brings us in, and he doesn't give up on us. He keeps his hands on us. He disciplines us, and he protects us. So here's the thing. We can be thankful that we are fully known by God, listen, fully known by God, good and bad, and that none of it can separate us from God. Okay, number two, God's near you, verse 7 through 12. Where can I go from your spirit, or where can you flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the utmost parts of the sea, but see, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. All right, so we see a couple pictures that the psalmist uses here. So we move into the section that says, God is near you. And sort of the main, if you put that slide up, the God's near you slide, the main thing you want to get from this is that you are not alone, but God is a very present help in times of trouble. Now, times of trouble look many different ways. And again, I told you that this is a psalm, and it's so it's, it's, it's symbolic. <clears throat> And here's the truth of this. The truth is we can't escape God if we try. In the first section, it was we can't trick God if we try. The sec this section is we can't escape God if we try. Now, for some of us, that's going to be comforting. And for some of us, that's going to be unsettling. Like, like me, I can't get away from God. Oh, my God, I never can do what I want to do. True. And then, and then <laughs> but then also that you, God is always near. It's always present. You can let it unsettle you or you can let it comfort you, but the reality is that's what it is. And this is what he says. He said, where can I flee? No, he's trying. He uses flee. Like, where can I escape is another word. We can do that later. Where can I flee from the present? Then he says, by sin is the heaven, you're there. Now, here's a couple of things, of pictures that you're going to look at. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, so I'm going to give it to you very quickly. So he, he lays it out in spiritual terms, in time and distance terms, and in chaos. So when he says, if I sent to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. He's talking about the spiritual destinations of where we are. He says, listen, God is bigger even than the spiritual aspect. It doesn't end with just your earthly situation that God is still going to be relevant to you after you die. And whether you end up in heaven or in hell, God's authority extends to 
to both places. So you're not going to be able to escape God. And we can be encouraged by this in that God is ever present when we're spiritually attacked. If we look at Romans 8, 39, uh, Romans 8, verse 38 through 39, it says, I am convinced you guys should know this verse almost by heart. I use this a lot. That nothing, <laughs> that nothing can separate us from God's love. And watch what he says. He says, neither death nor life, right? This is a spiritual, this is, this is not just this life terms. Angels and demons, powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or the earth below. This is the assurances that we have that we cannot be separated from this God that loves us. This God that knows us intimately, knows us completely, loves us extravagantly. We cannot be separated at all from him in this life or in the next. That's what the psalmist is saying. And as a result of that, when we receive spiritual attack in this life, listen, you have power and you are loved by God amidst that spiritual attack. The enemy will attack you spiritually and you can know that God is bigger than the spiritual attacks that you receive. God is bigger than time for us. He uses, he uses uh, time. If you jump back to the, to the, there you go. And it says, if, 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 he says, if you take the wings, if I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the almost parts of the sea, what he means is, if I take the wings of the morning, he's talking about sunrise, and then to dwell to the utmost parts of the sea, they would call that the west. That's the sunset. So he said, whether, what, what, wherever I happen to be in the time continuum, I know you're like, what time continuum? How do we end up in that? And so, <laughs> wherever I end up in the time continuum, there's, there's no time, there's no place in, in, in time that that God that can separate me from God. I don't know, you can bring that very near to you, right? You say, okay, that sounds really complex. Okay, that means that whatever stage of life you're in, that God is still very present in your stage of life. Let's go even closer. There's a lot of you who are single. I'm just going to go right here. And your singleness means different things to you. Some of you think, uh, whatever it means, you allow it to, you allow it to dictate something. You allow it to, 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 to carry some sort of value definition about who you are. Some of you are with, a, with someone else. You allow, so you allow that to make you have some sort of value. You feel more value or less or whatever it is. But the scripture says that no matter what, where you end up in time, God is there. He says, if I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the most parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. There's no aspect in my life, there's no part of my life that's less or more important than the next. Now that's easy to say, easy to hear. You're probably like, yeah, of course. But for some reason, midnight hours happen and we start to think that, man, God's, you start to feel like God's looking over you. How come I don't have husband? How come I don't have wife? How come I don't have kids? How come I don't have job? How come I'm this? How come I don't have, right? As you're moving from one stage of life to the next, God hasn't forgotten you in any of your stages. He's present in all of the time continuum. And then darkness, he says, surely darkness should follow me. And darkness here means chaos. It's chaos in order. What the psalmists always use darkness to symbolize chaos and light to symbolize order. It, in the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. The earth without form and void was dark. Darkness was on the face of the deep, chaos. And the Spirit of God moves on the face of the water and said, Let there be light, let there be order. It's, this is the poetry, right? And so when we see it, if you see, surely the chaos shall fall on me. Even the night shall be uh, light about, even, even the night shall be light about me or around me. It's around me all over. And then it says, indeed, darkness shall not hide from you. So God is not existing outside of your chaos, but he's in the middle of it. I had my dad come and talk to me just recently. He said something to me that he's always said. I don't know why he said to me like it was new. <laughs> he said it in a different way. And I've said this to you before. If you haven't been here a while, here it is. It said that life is stormy weather, right? Life is stormy weather. You either going into a storm, you're in the middle of a storm, or you're walking out of a storm, but life is stormy weather. Said differently, life is chaotic. You either walking, you're about to get into a chaotic situation, you are in the middle of chaos right now, or you're just walking away from something chaotic, but this is the continuum that we live in. That's what the point is. 
And the peace that passes understanding in the midst of chaos is in the eye of the storm, is right in the middle of the storm. That's what he, my dad was telling me this. Hopefully I don't have to use it anymore more time soon. <laughs> I don't need no more chaos. He said the peace is in the middle of the storm. And he said, the peace is Jesus, and that's where Jesus is. It's right there in the middle. He said, don't run away from the chaos. Run right into it, because in the middle of the storm is where peace is. In the middle of the storm is where Jesus is. And this is what this is saying. Look what it says in the second half. The darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. He says that the chaos that we perceive doesn't look like chaos to God. The night doesn't look like night to God. It shines like the day. It says the darkness and the light are both alike to you. You walking with that, right? Are you seeing that? That the chaos in your life, you're like, oh my gosh, the world is falling, the sky is falling, and God is like, actually, the sky's not falling. It all makes sense to me, right? It's not chaos to him. It's chaos to us, but it's not chaos to him. We can be thankful that God isn't thrown by the chaos of our life. That God isn't surprised by the chaotic stuff that shows up in our life. Not only is he not thrown off by it, but he can speak into it. You know that Jesus calms the storm in the scriptures. And he can calm the storm in your life as well. Here's what the enemy wants us to do. The enemy wants to see our chaos in our life, and he wants us to resent God for that chaos. He wants us to ask questions like, where is God now? He wants to question God's love for us. He wants to make you say, if God loves me, why is my life chaotic? If God loves me, why is it this or why is that? If God loves me, or said differently, God doesn't seem to love me. That's one of the lies he wants you to believe. The other lie he wants you to believe is that God is just impotent, that he is subject to chaos, that he can't do anything about the chaos in your life. These are the things that the enemy wants to tell us. <clears throat> he wants to use us, use, use uh, 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 the chaos and the, the darkness and the, the time in our life and the, uh, the spiritual attacks to, to reveal that God is either not powerful enough or he doesn't care enough. That's what the enemy is trying to get you to believe. But the truth is, the truth is that we can be thankful that God is present in the storm, that he's bigger than the storm, and that he's going to redeem us through the storm. That's what we talked about last week. That he's going to redeem us through the storm. <clears throat> mm. The last piece, God's destined us. Uh, verse 13 through 16. Actually, let me jump back for a second. If you're taking notes, then take this note for the, take this note for the last section. We could be thankful God shared, shows his care for us and that he never leaves our side, chaos or not. God destined us, verse 13 to 16. For you formed me in my inward parts, you covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance, substance being yet unformed, and in your book they were all written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. Go to the God destined you slide. He says, you are not a mistake, but God made you with intention and purpose. All right, number one, God knows you. He knows the ins and outs of you. He knows all the mental things that you're dealing with. He knows all the feels. He's all the motivation. He knows everything about you. Number two, God is near. He can't be separated. Us. The spiritual realm can't separate him. Time can't separate him. Distance can't separate him. Chaos can't separate him. God is a very near and a very present help to us in our time of need. And then the last thing is that God is proactive and intentional when he made you. You are not a mistake, but you were made with an intention and with purpose. These are the three things that we can be thankful to God about when we run into tough moments. God is intentional with us. You're not an accident. And neither are the things in your life. Listen to that. You are not an accident and neither are the things in your life. Some of you are going through yucky stuff. Some of you are going through awesome stuff. None of that stuff is by accident. God is using and can redeem all of it. Not only can he use it and redeem it, 
But if we're looking at this scripture, he foresaw it. And he put you into motion all the same. He knew all the things you were going to have to deal with. Quickly, he said, the scripture said he formed you from the inside out. I love it that he starts with the inside, not the outside. Like he said, he formed you from the inside out. Uh, he said that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You're made with excellence. You're made with intention. You're made your masterpiece. Um, this is like some millennial, everybody gets a trophy talk, right? This is, this is, this is, this is a realization that, that what, for whatever flaws you happen to have in your life, whether it's a disorder or you just are personality that people don't get along with or, or you, whatever your flaw, you feel, everybody feels like they've got something that they're not great at. You're like, okay, God made a mistake. My nose is too big. There's too many dots on my face. Like all the things that I say to myself in the mirror, maybe, you know, uh, my ears, when I was younger, my ears stuck out, you know, so I, I got all the names, Dumbo, Bird, all the things. It's okay, though. <laughs> I've recovered. I've recovered and I made it. No, real talk, though. All of us look in the mirror and find a deficiency. And all of us feel like, man, sometimes it's feel like, man, I wish I could. I wish I were. What's up? This and that. And if not today, then maybe tomorrow when somebody shows up and makes you feel because they're awesome and you're not in some area. But the truth is that for whatever things you have, for whatever deficiencies or for whatever uh, issues you were born with, that God did that intentionally and he does it with an eternal purpose in mind. And because he's good, he's trustworthy and we can trust him. It doesn't change the fact that you were fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful here again. Wonderful here is not the synonym for good. Wonderfully here is made with all. That you are infinitely complex. That God is doing so many unfathomable, unfathomable things in you and through you. Eternal things that you have no idea about. But you are wonderfully made. You are made with wonder. You're made with all. It says he brings eternal potential from nothing. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. And then it says, and in your book, they were all written, written uh, the days fashioned for me. He said, before I was anything, you saw what I could be. God sees the potential in us. And then we have a destiny before our birth. <clears throat> you can trust God because he saw you coming put you into motion. You can trust God because you saw him coming, you can, he put you into motion. And because his paths are laid out, your paths are laid out for you, you can be thankful that God is doing good things with your life in bad situations. So you can go with your prayers and your supplications with God and you can be thankful in those prayers and supplications knowing that God is working it for your good toward the end. <clears throat> your story Written in God's book. I love that. In your book, they were all written. Written in God's book is not yet finished. Whatever you're going through, whatever you're dealing with, the story isn't over. There's another page to turn. God's not finished with you quite yet. Don't allow the enemy to rob you of the faith and trust you need to have in God for the goodness that he created you for. The enemy does. He wants to sow doubt and confusion. He said, man, if I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, I'm confused. Because I don't have this. No, no. He wants to sow confusion and doubt. Or rather, God is actually good. And whether he actually made you intentionally or whether he made a mistake. Literally, the enemy wants to sow into your brain that God made a mistake with you. I have to say out loud, right? You're like, God doesn't make mistakes. And yet, many people are in really dark places because they believe God made a mistake with them. That's the enemy. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Don't let the enemy tell us that. We can be thankful that God intentionally, with every aspect of our lives, moves us toward the eternal purposes he made us to accomplish. All right, conclusion. Dependency, thanksgiving, and all these things that we saw in this passage. 
We got three ways that we can be thankful to God in moments of stress that will cause us to be thankful to him while we're making our prayers and petitions to him so that we can have this elusive peace that doesn't make sense. Here are the three things, or here's a few things. God is a you expert. You can be thankful that you are fully known by God, that he, that he, he knows everything about you, and, 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 and he knows how you are and what you are and what you do, and he chooses to love you and be a part of your life all the same. We know that God is always nearby, that nothing can separate us from him, uh, and that because of that, we can overcome anything that's bigger than us because nothing is bigger than him. And we can know that God made us and sustains us. And so we need God. We need this expertness of God uh, for guidance, for help, and for purpose. I said that God's an expert. I know I've said that a couple of times. Uh, God knows you better than you know you. You ever surprise yourself? I'm surprised myself. I don't know why I keep doing this. Everybody just raise your hand just to make my life feel better. Okay, there you go. I knew, I knew it could happen. Okay, all right. I just need to make sure it was happening. Okay. Maybe something's wrong with y'all's arms. Uh, I've surprised myself before, but, but I've never surprised God, right? God knows me better than I know me. God knows you better than you know you. I depend on God to tell me what to do because if I were to depend on me, I would make mistakes. We depend on God and therefore we can be thankful to God for his knowing us. Uh, you are not alone, but God is a very present help in times of trouble. You are not a mistake, but God made you with intention and purpose. The last verse, 17 to 18. How precious also are their thoughts, O God, how great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they should be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. If you're in your Bible or if you're in a tough place, what I want you to do is underline, when I awake, I am still with you. The sum of all this for the psalmist is that in the middle of all this, I can go down and I can wake up and whatever's going on in my life, when I am awake, I'm with you. That's what he said. That you're ever present, that you're always here. There's a modern song, song that um, we used to sing in my dad's church or in churches that I grew up in that I think is... Uh, appropriate for tonight to end. So I'm going to read the lyrics to you. But I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and I want you to think about the lyrics as I read them. The hymn is called I Won't Complain. Some of you may know it. Some of you may not. But I want you to listen to the words that it says, especially as it pertains to being thankful in times of stress and anxiety. For the reasons we gave. The songwriter wrote, I've had some good days. I've had some hills to climb. I've had some weary days. And I've had some sleepless nights. But when I look around and I think things over, all of my good days outweigh my bad days. I won't complain. Sometimes the clouds hang low, so low I can barely see the road. And I ask the question, Lord, why is there so much pain? But he knows what's best for me. Although my weary eyes they can't see. So I'll just say, thank you, Lord. I won't complain. The Lord has been good to me. He's been good to me. More than this whole world or you could ever be. He's been so good to me. He dried all my tears away. Turn my midnights into day. So I'll just say, thank you, Lord. I won't complain. Father God, I ask that that be true for us.